Yeah. Get ready. I'm ready. Coming. My name is Craig Lalonde. I'm a firefighter with North Hays County Fire Rescue, and today I'm going to talk to you about Mayday Calls. Learning objectives for today, I've uh, got a few of them. Firefighters should be able to define what a Mayday is, should be able to identify the time window in which a Mayday is most likely to occur, most common, uh, you know, learn the most common causes of Maydays, identify three ways in which you can train for a Mayday, identify three informational pieces used when calling Mayday and describe each, and then you should be able to correctly call a Mayday at the end of the presentation. So what is a Mayday? Anytime a firefighter calls, uh, cannot safely exit a hazard zone without assistance, or when a unit operating inside the hazard zone fails to respond to a radio call within three attempts. So that would be like uh, if someone outside I see, or someone else inside tries reaching someone interior, and they don't respond within three attempts, they can call a Mayday for that person. Uh, for any more information on Mayday calls and what constitutes uh, good reasons for calling a Mayday, uh, examples of that would be NFPA 1407. So some statistics on Mayday. Uh, almost half of Maydays occur, just over half of Maydays occur before or between midnight and 6 a.m., uh, which makes sense, right, because then you're, you're at that time, you're asleep, uh, you've already run a little bit uh, during the day, you're not fully awake, not functioning, uh, your, your brain's not, not fully awake yet. And for 2448 departments, almost three, over three quarters of uh, Mayday calls occur in the last 12 hours. And for 4896 departments like us, almost 60% occur in the last 12 hours, which makes sense because you've been running calls already, uh, possibly had some, some training, PT, stuff like that, you're already worn down and it does fall between that midnight and 6 a.m. First two companies make up 57% of Mayday calls. Uh, when you think about that, you've got uh, first two companies that might not have a complete uh, picture of what's going on. They're working longer than, than everybody else, more time on scene, and they don't have someone outside looking out for changing conditions. And then the importance of doing a proper 360. Uh, on fires where a Mayday is called, 57% had no 360 and 18% at an incomplete 360, which shows for the officers or people riding up uh, what's, uh, how important it is to get a good 360. The most common types of Mayday's called are being lost or separated from the hose line and then falls into basements. Uh, we don't have a lot of basements in Central Texas, but can someone tell me what we do have that's similar in our district? Split level. Split level. So there's some, uh, Big houses like in, uh, you know, Headwaters has some things like that where, yeah, you walk in on the first floor or you think is maybe the bottom floor and it's on a slope and so you got like a walkout basement split level type deal and uh, those can be pretty disorienting. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind for our district. Uh, so of the, those that uh, get lost or separated from the hose line, 60% of those who are, are those who went in without a hose line. What are some reasons you go in without a hose line? Rapid search. Rapid search. And known rescue. Yeah, known rescue. So if someone uh, you know, comes up to you when you get on scene and says, hey, hey, like my grandma or my mom, whatever, lives in, she's in this room, she's wheelchair bound, I can't get her out myself. You look, it's a viable rescue. You can go in without a hose line but you do run that risk. Uh, so the other 40% of firefighters who left the hose line, uh, any ideas why you would leave the hose line? Good examples of that. Maybe just trying to search a room? Yeah, yeah, I mean like in trying to search a room, you know, if, especially if we, you're looking at like commercial structures and you're not gonna be humping tons of hose around. Uh, big areas just to try to search and keep oriented on that hose. And so, yeah, rat, like you said, rapid search, uh, something like that. So prevent falls in basements, we talked about the importance of doing a 360. So call out a basement on a 360. And then if you find one, so say like we go on one of those calls where you go interior, 
you're just searching around, whatever, and then you open a door and there's stairs downstairs, your stairs going down, most likely have a split level or possibly a basement. So preventing a mayday, there are some things you can do in order to prevent a mayday. Maintaining situational awareness, which is huge on everything we do, but uh, you know, especially when you're going in something like an IDLH environment, maintaining situational awareness is uh, of the utmost importance. So staying on the hose line or properly oriented to it. We talked about the risks you have leaving the hose line, uh, but being properly oriented to it, that way, you know, you if you do leave it, hopefully someone on your crew can keep you properly oriented to it, so you've got a, a safety line. Closely monitoring your air supply. So, like, if you go in, uh, go interior, and then it takes you a thousand psi to get the seat of the fire. You know, it's going to take you a thousand psi to get out, right? So then, monitoring that. So make sure you don't put yourself in a bad situation. Staying with your partner or crew, and then monitoring the radio for changing conditions on the fire ground. Uh, and then it's not about, we got one of the cartoons here, so you're brave enough to call the, uh, call the mayday. It's not about uh, being tough enough to get out of yourself. It's about asking, being able to ask for help when you think you might need it, or you're in a situation that could get you in trouble, because I know, you're, you know your crew would rather activate RIT or try to help get you out. Uh, rather than lose you because you thought you'd handle it yourself. Being prepared, uh, what tools do you guys have in your gear to help self-extricate? Heavy knife, pliers, screwdrivers, wire cutters. What do you got? Uh, a pair of work gloves. I, I, I drive, so I don't carry much in my gear. All right, but yeah, so there's lots of different, different things you can carry uh, that can help you in a tricky situation, uh, get out of uh, entanglements, stuff like that. And then knowing what tools from the engine can help you, you know, if you're in a, a specific riding position, you might always have a go-to tool, that sort of thing. And knowing how to use those to help get you out of a sticky situation. The training, there's three easy ways you can train. Practice your mayday call, you can do that uh, at home, you can do that from the recliner, you can do that uh, you know, in the bathroom mirror, whatever it is. Putting yourself in odd and uncomfortable situations, uh, blacked out on air and practicing your mayday, and that might just be something like getting bunked out, uh, turn the lights off in the bay, call under a brush truck, you know, practice calling your mayday situations like that. And then practice manipulating the radio, bunked out with gloves. Uh, it's something we don't do a lot, but being able to manipulate the radio in awkward situations with your gloves on where you don't have that dexterity. And something to think about is, if your, is your radio accessible when you're bunked out? You know, um, a lot of times we walk around with it uh, where it's convenient when we're on EMS calls, that sort of thing, kind of high on the hip, but being able to adjust it or make sure it's to a point where your radio sticks out under your bunker coat so you're not having to dig way up in there if you need it. Call a mayday, so know your mayday call and practice it. For us, our SOP is the who, what, and where. There are lots of other things depending on what department you're with could be like Lunars, you can that sort of thing. But for us, it's who, which is identifying who have, is having the mayday. Could be by name, assignment, like um, with fire attack or your engine company. What, the conditions of the mayday, so uh, you know, are there any injuries, visibility, heat, smoke, that sort of thing. And uh, you know, are you lost, are you trapped? And where, so current locations, uh, which goes with situational awareness we talked about earlier. Being able to recognize, you know, what are you, what side of the building you're on? Uh, are you in a kitchen? Are you in a bedroom? Uh, what floor are you on? Those sort of things can help uh, any crew's RIP team uh, locate you uh, and help get you out. And then, if you're able to, providing what needs will help resolve the situation. You know, under all that stress, it might be something you're not able to do. But if you can, you know, if you're you're pinned under something and you know you've got certain equipment that can help get you out calling for that, uh, things, things of that nature. So we're going to listen to uh, a mayday call, and then after we listen to this, uh, have a discussion about uh, you know, what you think went right, what you think about the whole thing. Uh, <laughs>
with Houston, Effie, and so obviously someone who's a captain at Houston has seen some stuff, probably has a lot of experience, a lot of fire under their belt. Um, but what were some things that you guys thought about the whole situation, about his call, uh, anything like that? The radio traffic was very, very garbled. Yeah. You really Hit his? To, yes, you really had to listen to it. Yeah. Um, he sounded like he was pretty excited, so you know, he's stuck in his bottle there where he should have taken a few deep breaths to come down. Relayed that message was a little bit clearer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the protocols are, on, what the bailings are on that, but I mean, just for us, I mean, you know, a lunar, we were, you know, he knew he was in a window, so stay there. You know, you can do your kills. That's what I found right there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that was just weird. That's a tough one too. You're on fifth floor, so it's obviously a high rise fire. Right. So high risk, low frequency. Yeah. It'll be yeah. Harder. Mayday. Um, but yeah, like Rick Hanks said, it was a very, very excited. Which I mean, it's life death situation, yeah. so you're gonna be excited. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I mean, he escaped with minimal injuries, but you know, like. Someone with that level of experience, yeah, you hear how how nervous and how excited you hear in his voice, and just the, which I thought was a good example of uh, the importance of yeah conserving air, like you said, uh, and uh, maintaining kind of your like your composure after calling a or well while you're in that situation and being able to focus on getting yourself. To a place, or you know, where where you can have uh, someone reach you, you know, um, anything that y'all felt went well about the situation? It's not like you had a bunch of guys there to look, so that was nice. Yeah. Like, yeah. Had a ladder. It sounds like yeah, the ladder company was able to get him out of the yeah. get him out. So I mean, there's no one. Anytime Mayday is called, you're going to get a lot of people. Like, a lot of people. Yeah. So, it kind of sucks for us up here. We're, we have two engines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not like that, where they probably had, who knows, that big of a, like a high rise. You know, like have yeah. three, four, five companies um, calling to, to help out. I think set, establishing grit at the very beginning of an incident is paramount. You know? Yeah, yeah. For so sure. you have someone ready to go. Uh, in that, in a case like that, right? Yeah. All right, well, uh, now is a good time. Uh, for the reading, I got uh, all my statistics from projectmayday.net. Uh, composed, uh, they compile information from tons of different, thousands of different uh, career and volunteer departments across the country, uh, if you're interested. And then uh, it's always a good time to review your Mayday SOP. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you.